Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to a new Zor Education. Um, well, we continue talking about vectors, but today is a, a lecture with a different philosophy, I would say. Um, if you remember, maybe, um, in the beginning of the prerequisite course, uh, Mass 14, um, I was talking about abstraction. So, mathematicians are involved in very important process. They have an object, they might learn something about this object, about its properties. But then they are trying to basically separate properties from the object and go to a certain higher level um, saying, okay, let's talk about all objects which have these particular properties. What can we say about this? Well, from these properties, which can be, you know, taken as an axiom, you can derive certain other properties. But since we have already, on the upper level, we're talking about any object which has these primary properties, then all the subsequent properties which were derived from these primary ones will be true for any other object which have the same prime properties. So these prime properties, like axioms basically, if we take them into, um, uh, into consideration, they are uh, changing completely the philosophy, not from the object we research its properties, but from the properties we research other properties. Now, this is exactly what I'm going to talk about today. We were talking before about vector spaces. Um, usually it was like two-dimensional, uh, three-dimensional. Now the last lecture was about n-dimensional um, properties. Right now I will not talk about any particular space, vector space. I will be talking about any kind of a set which has the properties similar to whatever we were talking about. I'm, I'm talking about basic properties, primary properties. And then, based on this, I will try to derive certain um, consequences, but they will be applicable not only to these two-dimensional, three-dimensional, or n-dimensional vector spaces we uh, learned before, but they will be applicable to any other space or set which has the same prime properties. And there are many sets which share properties with those two or three dimensional vector, vector spaces. And we will call them vector spaces as well. Okay? Okay, so this lecture uh, is part of the course Mass for Mass Plus and Problems, uh, presented on Unizor.com. Unizor.com is a totally free uh, website. There are no uh, ads. Uh, sign-in is optional, so it's completely open for everybody. Prerequisite course, which I just mentioned, Mass 14. There are other courses on the same website, like Physics 14, for example, or Relativity for All. And uh, what's important is every um, lecture has text notes right next to this video lecture on the Unisor.com and I suggest you to read these notes as well. Also, if it's a problem which is explained, either during the lecture or if you read it in the textual description of this lecture, try to solve this problem yourself. So if you're watching and I'm presenting the problem, pause the video and think. If you are reading the text notes for this lecture, again, stop reading, do it yourself. I, whether you solve or you don't solve the problem doesn't doesn't I mean it does matter, <laughs> but even if you don't solve, it's still very helpful if you will think about the problem, and try to solve it yourself. That's the development of your creativity, basically. All right, so back to business. Again, I am going to talk about certain basic properties or primary properties or axioms of some set. And then, from these properties, I will derive certain other properties and characteristics. But that would be applicable to all the sets which share the primary properties. 
share the axioms. So what are the important primary properties or axioms which we kind of take as, as granted when we were talking about two or three dimensional and dimensional vectors. Now these uh, axioms I'm going to talk about right now and we will take them as postulates or axioms or primary properties and then we will see what can be done about it. So, we are talking about abstract vector space, not concrete, not n-dimensional, but abstract vector space, which means any kind of a set which possess certain basic properties. So what are these properties? Okay. First of all, now let's talk about V is a set which has certain elements as any set. Now, first of all, there is an operation of addition which is defined within the framework of this set. Now, what does it mean? Well, we can add two vectors together, right? Let's say two-dimensional case. One vector, another vector, and that's their sum. Okay, so this is concrete addition of concrete vectors. Now, what I'm talking about right now, about abstract vector space, I'm just talking that for any two vectors which belong to V, for any A and B belongs to set V exist element A plus B which also belong to B. So for any two vectors we have another vector which basically belongs to the same set. That's why it's, we call it vector abstract vector. Okay. So there is a sum of these vectors. This is called a sum. So I'm not explaining how I'm doing it. I'm just talking about existence of this element. So basically it's like you're putting into correspondence if this is V. So for any two there is a correspondence their sum. Okay. Now as an example of the vector space, which is not like two or three dimensional vector space, we can have, for instance, a set of all functions, just all functions or all continuous functions defined uh, uh, on uh, uh, real numbers, for example, or on complex numbers. Now, if you have two functions, you can always add them if they are real functions using the operations with real numbers, right? So all these functions also basically satisfy this particular um, axiom, right? So in theory, all the functions in some sense we can consider as a vector space. But this is only a one particular property, primary property or axiom. We have some others which it must satisfy to make a nice theory. So, what other properties are? Well, next property is um, A plus B is equal to B plus A. Commutative property. So, for again, for any A and B which belong to set V, we should say that this is true. So, commutative property we take as granted, as a postulate. Next associative. So for any A, B and C which belong to V, A plus B plus C, let's say this parenthesis, is the same as A plus B plus C, these parentheses. So parentheses are supposed to be performed first, so either you perform first A plus B and then result to C, or you first perform B plus C and then A plus the result. And it's also commutative, so you can actually have B plus C plus A, or whatever, C plus B plus A, whatever the sequence is. So this is associative law, okay? So again, we take it as a, a postulate, as an axiom, as a primary properties of this vector set. So only sets which possess these qualities and some others which I'm talking about 
will be a vector space and then we will start deriving certain other theorems from it. So what's next? Next is there is one particular element set which we will call zero such that if you add it to any other set, to, to any other element of this set, it will not change. That's why we call it zero. Well, in, uh, let's say, n-dimensional vector space, we have no vector, which is zero, zero, etc., zero, right? So if you will add it to any other vector, n-dimensional vector, that n-dimensional vector will have exactly the same components. So that's why it's called no vector. So we are assuming that there is an element called uh, no vector in this particular as well. Why do we need it? Well, we need it basically for developing the theory. Without this, our theory would be really very, very poor. What's next? Next, we have an element um, since we have zero, right? So for any element A from V, there is another element, we will call it minus A, which also belongs to V, such that A plus minus A will give you a zero null vector. So it's opposite vector, right? So there is always a vector and there is an opposite vector. Same thing, this is a vector and this is its opposite. Their sum is equal to no vector, right? So that's why we need this to have nice arithmetic between all these elements of our set, between all these vectors. So this actually gives me the operation of addition. Now I can say that my operation of addition is defined basically similarly to regular operation of addition with either real numbers or complex numbers or uh, three-dimensional vectors or whatever else. Because in all these cases, concrete cases, these axioms are um, uh, satisfied. But again, since I'm not talking about any concrete um, incarnation of vector space, I'm talking about abstract vector space. So I don't know how it's basically done, as long as these properties are satisfied. Okay. Now, sometimes, just for a shorthand, if you have, for instance, this, if minus b is opposite to b and a is a, and uh, I'm basically adding one element and another element, I can say that this is exactly the same thing as a minus b, but this is just a notation, just a shorthand. There is no such thing as subtraction. There is only addition uh, to an opposite element. So this is just a shorthand. If I, if I will write it this way, I assume it's this, basically, just for a shorthand. But yes, obviously we can call it subtraction, but in theory we do not define subtraction that way as, a, as another operation. No, there is no other operation. There is an operation of addition and there is an opposite element. Okay, so that's about addition. Now, what's also, what's also very important about vectors is vectors can be um, multiplied by a scalar. Uh, vector times two, for example. So this is a vector, and this is a twice as long vector, right? So, we, are, we have exactly the same thing with uh, abstract vectors we would like to be able to multiply it by something, by some scalar. So there is supposed to be another set of scalars, right? So that's scalars. Scalar. Now, for our purposes, now scalars are also supposed to have some arithmetic between them, because again, in in, let's say, the three-dimensional case, scalar is usually a real number, right? And real numbers also have addition or subtraction. So we can multiply, uh, let's say, we can multiply vector 
by 2 or we can multiply it by 3 plus 2, right? So we assume that there is an operation of plus between two different scalars because they are real numbers in our previous case. Now, instead of going into the same kind of abstraction with scalars, I really don't want uh, you to deviate from the vector side. So for now, and probably for foreseeable future, I will assume that the scalars are just real numbers. It's simpler. That in, but in theory, I can say that, okay, scalars are some kind of uh, set of um, some, some, some elements, and these elements can be also like added to each other, subtracted to each other, multiplied by zero should be there, one should be, etc. So instead of going into abstraction about scalars, I just assume that it's simpler to assume that we have just the uh, uh, real numbers as scalars. So I'm introducing operations between vectors of uh, abstract vector space and scalars which are really assumed to be real numbers. Maybe I will not say that this is real numbers, but I will assume that the properties of the scalars are exactly the same as properties of real numbers, which means they can be subtracted, added, uh, multiplied, zero, one, etc. So what properties which I need? Okay, let me finish with this one. And we were talking about multiplication by a scalar. So for every for every element A which belongs to my um, abstract vector space and element alpha again any element alpha um, any element alpha which belongs to my scalars exists something which I called um, alpha times uh, A which belongs to a, a game vector space. So that means that I can multiply vector by scalar to get some kind of other vector. Again, this is like an axiom. I'm saying that, okay, the operation between any element of the vector space and any element of the scalar space, which basically has the same properties as, the, as real numbers, there is their product. Now, I assume that this product is commutative. So you can actually multiply from the left, multiply from the right, this scalar, and you will have exactly the same number, uh, the same vector as a result. Next. Next, there is something which is, so this is commutative, commutative. Now, associative, alpha and beta times A. So I assume that there is a product between two scalars, and if they are real numbers, obviously we can multiply them together. But that would be the same as if I will do first uh, beta and then alpha. And by the way, because again we are assuming all the properties of the scalars are the same as real numbers, instead of alpha and beta, I can have beta and alpha, because in real numbers, num m multiplication of real numbers is commutative, right? So this is another axiom which I am basically postulating. Now, there is something which is called no uh, scalar. So there exists a new scalar which belongs to S, such S. If you multiply this new scalar by any element A, you will get zero uh, no vector. So this is a vector. This belongs to V, and this belongs to V. So this is a no vector. So this zero, which I am uh, slashing. That's basically a scalar 
I would like to differentiate one zero from another. This zero is from a scalar, this zero is from a vector set. So from a scalar, it's a constant actually, um, uh, like real number zero. And this is a null vector, which means that's the, that's the null which, we, which it, if we will add it to any other vector, will not change the vector. So that's what null vector is. So understand this difference very important in this case. Also, there is a, an element which I call 1. And this is again, if we are prototyping this after real numbers, this is a number 1. This is number 0, this is number 1. Such that if you will multiply it by A, you will get exactly A. So multiplication of vector by a scalar 1 will not change the vector. If you multiply it by 0, you will get null vector. If you multiply it by 1, it will be no change. So I'm assuming, again, that 0 and 1 are element of scalar. Uh, but again, if we are assuming it's real numbers, that's fine. OK, what else? And there is a distributive law. That's very important. Now, there is a distributive law versus sum of two different vectors. That's alpha times A plus alpha times B. And there is a distributive law versus two scalars. So that's alpha A plus beta A. Now, all these properties, again, we postulate. We are assuming that this set and this set have all the properties which I was talking about, about addition and about the multiplication by scalar. So that's it. OK, that's it about properties. Now, what I will do, using these properties, I will um, prove a couple of theorems, very, very simple theorems. But nevertheless, the number of properties which we were talking about right now, the primary properties, the axioms, the postulates, if you wish. Now, all these are sufficient to prove certain uh, theorems. And these theorems will be true for any vector space if it satisfies the axioms we were talking about. So my first problem is, OK, there is only one, OK, one no vector. So I would like to prove that there is only one null vector in the vector space. There is no two nulls, null vectors. Now, null vector, again, it's the vector which added to something else will not change that something else. OK, but let's just assume that there are two, and we will come to a contradiction. So let's say we will have O1 and O2, two different null vectors. Now. If this is no, if O2 is no vector, then add it to O1, it should be O1, right? Now, I know that our operation of addition is commutative, so let's write down this, this way. Now, if O1 is no vector, then add it to something else, like in O2, it should be O2, right? Now, the left parts are the same which means the right parts must be the same. Now, left parts are the same because of commutative axiom, which we have assumed, right? So these must be the same. So there is no two different O1 and O2. There is only one O2. Oh, there is only one O, which is null vector. There is only one null vector for any vector space. And that's important property. Next. Next is there is only one uh, opposite element. So if you have an element A, there is an element minus A, but there is only one element minus A. If you add them together, that would be null vector. Okay? So how can I prove that? All right. Let me write the following. Minus A1 plus A plus minus a2. So let's just assume that element a has two different opposite elements. Now, what is this uh, expression? On one hand, if I will put an associative, associative law here, 
Now, element plus opposite, supposed to be null vector, null vector plus any element should be at this element, so it should be minus a, one. On the other hand, if I will do exactly the same, but I will put parentheses here, what happens here? Again, we are using associative law, which we have assumed is true. Now, if this element is opposite to this one, then its sum is supposed to be null vector. Null vector plus anything should be that anything. It should be minus i2. So again, left parts are the same. Again, I'm using associative, commutative, or whatever. So they are the same, which means the right part is supposed to be the same. So there is no two different opposite elements. There is only one opposite element to A. Okay? And uh, the third one is... Okay, the third one is... If I will multiply my vector by minus 1, I will get opposite. Okay? How can I prove that? Okay, here it is. If I will put 1 times a plus minus 1 times a, let's see what happens. Now, 1 times a is a and this one is minus 1 times a on one hand. On another hand I'm using distributive law so it's 1 plus minus 1 times a which means 0 times a which means 0 that's number and this is null vector right so left sides are equal so the right sides are equal so a plus minus one times a is equal to zero now what does it mean well by definition this is an opposite if element plus something is equal to null vector that's how i defined opposite element. I said that for any element there is an opposite, sum of which which are, are equal to null vector. Okay, so minus 1 times a is opposite. But just the previous problem was, I was talking about uh, that there is no two different opposite elements. There is only one. I have proven that. So if this is opposite, then it must be equal to that to that opposite which is basically th which exists for any element a so that's how we have proven that minus 1 multiplied by any vector a will give the opposite to vector a which we have symbolically expressed as minus a okay these are three little very little theorems which I have like proven in maybe one minute each now there are much more important uh, theorems which again can be derived from the axioms which we were talking about and all these theorems will be true for any vector space which satisfies these axioms for example as I was just saying we can just consider a set of functions or we can have a set of uh, rotations by certain angle and angle defines rotation again some of the rotations would be some of the angles and stuff like this so we can actually apply this to all kinds of the universe of different vector spaces which exist. Not only Euclidean vector spaces like 2 and 3 and, and dimensional, which we were talking before. So this is the most important part actually of today's lecture, that we can completely divorce ourselves from concrete implementation of certain axioms, of certain postulates or certain rules and say, okay, anything which satisfies this is vector space. And if I will derive my theorems only from these rules, 
without any regard to concrete incarnation, in con concrete object which satisfy these rules, then all our theorems will be true for all these cases. Okay, that's it for today. Uh, I suggest you to read the notes for these lectures. So you go to unizor.com, Math Plus and Problems course, go to Vectors category, and this is Vectors 07 and uh, read this uh, particular um, description and try to prove all these three uh, little theorems which I did yourself. Uh, the proofs are there, but try to do it yourself. And basically that's it. Thank you very much and good luck.